Bada boom, bada boom, butts. Bada boom, butts. Love it. Bada boom, butts. Big bada butts. Big bada boom. Big bada boom, butts. Bada butts. Lilo Dallas multi. Multi butts. God. Oh, such a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to episode 97 of Big Rebel Geeks, Speak your place for all your nerdy needs on BigRebel.com. I am your host, Lauren, the badass of Borderlands, and with me, as always, is the Baroness of Butter, Amaris Auntie Alex. But Forge. <laughs> and the jaunty, jubilant juggernaut of Joe. Hello. Hello. I can never follow up Alex's introduction. She has the best introductions. But Aww, Forge, what's that? It's you, awesome. Honey. <laughs> and I just have to say, hello. <laughs> Because I can't think of anything else. (laughs) (laughs) You can start your own alien-related thing or like a Godzilla-related thing or something. I don't know. Go crazy. I could have a Godzilla soundboard here and just press buttons. So every now and again, you're just like... That'd be totally cool. It would be amazing. Okay, kicking off with our time waste of the week. We have two this week. We're going to start off with one from our lovely listener, Stingo. Alex, do you want to introduce this one? Yeah, so Stingo sent me this time waste of the week, and it's called Thug Notes. And as far as I'm concerned, this has been the best thing I discovered on the internet lately. I I swear, (laughs) this is so good, you guys. (laughs) I'm so happy that Stingo put this on my radar. Basically, this is summary analysis of a classical book's Dare I say in thug speak? <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. The old gangster. Yeah, kind of. And you know what? It is hilarious. It is on point. The guy, even though he speaks in the way that you would imagine he would speak, he is incredibly intelligent and informed. It makes absolutely valid comments. And I would also say, for the comedic values, it would benefit reading those classical books ahead of time. So just mm. to say what he has on offering, and it's only been season one, he has The Great Back Gats to Kill a Mockingbird, 1984, Pride and Prejudice, Great Expectation, The Catcher in the Rye, Jane Air, mm-hmm. Hamlet, Of Mice and Men, Fahrenheit 441, Brave New World, Beowulf, oh my god, so many, Animal, Moby Dick, you, you guys get the idea, they're just excellent, excellent books. How many episodes are there? 20. 20? Yeah, the last oh. one is Frankenstein, and the first one is Crime and Punishment. Oh. Oh, that's a heavy one to start off with. I know this is going to sound coming wrong out of my mouth, but I was listening to the Great Gatsby (laughs) recap, and at one point, the narrator goes, after dealing with this white boy (laughs) angsty (laughs) <laughs> and I just died laughing because that is actually so on point. That yeah. whole book yeah. is about white boy angsty. <laughs> white boy angsty. <laughs> I think that's my new tagline. <laughs> yeah, and it's like that is so freaking on point. Why someone hasn't told me this a few years back when I was reading this book? My eyes has opened. Yeah, I had to do it for school. I had to do essays. Like if I'd seen this, if my essays would have been like. Screw this white boy <laughs> like, Oh, It would make my life so much better because I hated studying that book. Well, I read that book on my own. My parents gave it to read it to me, like most of the stuff on this list. But still, I-, I liked it and I appreciate it as a classical novel and its importance. And of course, there is a famous gif of Leo and blah, 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 blah. But <laughs> I really think this is a really great channel. And <laughs> if you've read any of those books or if you're interested in reading any of those books, this is a really good quick description of the book <laughs> and yeah it might be done a comedic comedic value but it doesn't mean it hasn't been done without thought or there hasn't been intelligence put behind it that is mm. absolutely the opposite and that is the point yeah the best comedy is the one that's actually quite intelligent there's thought behind it there's research and they've made it funny so there's actually real consideration for the source material before they do it so that's pretty awesome that is great thank you Singo so much this has entertained me today to the nth point I've been laughing my ass off here <laughs> this is the only way, reason I'm that, that awake at 10am in the morning on the Saturday <laughs> <laughs> going to the other end of the uh, YouTube spectrum not quite as joyous and amusing Something from someone that I've adored for many, many years and it's freaked me out. And I've spoken to um, about in the past, David Firth. I know, Joe, you know David Firth. Alex, have you seen any of his stuff? No, he does sound familiar, though. Salad Fingers. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> that is the correct response. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that is the right response. So this one's a little less grotesque, but it's quite poignant. In the current kind of political and media climate... 
it makes some very interesting short points. So this is Cream by David Firth. It's uh, 12 minutes long and it's an unusual art style. It kind of, kind of reminds me of all like the cut and stick animation from the early noughties. Yeah, it's, it's manipulated photos. So it's, yeah, it's actual photos that he's manipulated, yeah. Yeah, so it's a cautionary tale, I suppose, of product development and how it can be sh- revolutionary to the world. But if certain people don't like it everything could go absolutely wrong and it kind of reminded me of the book that i mentioned last week the end specialist like something revolutionary comes to the world and then all the fallout that comes from it so basic premise is what it seems to be something that's been developed at cern um in the large hadron collider that's what i got from the start <laughs> the guys at the large hadron collider made a product called cream and cream is amazing. It's a cure-all for utterly everything, including lack of food, lack of bling on your wrist, and so on and so forth. can even bring people back from the dead. Then it kind of expands into its impact on the world and how those people who... The one percenters, if you will, how they would react to this situation. And it's done in 10 minutes. Very, very clever. Very interesting to watch. Again, not as disturbing visually as salad fingers but still it's quite sinister it's quite yeah, you know it's, it's dark it's very prescient for our times and it is it's quite sinister like i think like a lot of people i sort of got into salad fingers when at college at film school but i kind of as a it really disturbed me and not always in a good way and so i was kind of like yeah, yeah i'm kind of done done with this you know it's, yeah. not, it's not very nice but this i think is a bit cleverer than salad fingers oh absolutely it's not just for shock value it's actually again it's got some thought intelligence behind it it's yeah got a... he's actually got something to say yeah it's not nowhere near in the same league but it's kind of on the same wavelength as charlie brooker's stuff i was about to say that black mirror yeah exactly it's kind of it's got something to say but it's doing it with a sort of wry sense of humor absolutely so check it out it's that one's 10 minutes and then go watch Thug Notes because you'll need a pick-me-up after <laughs> yeah, <laughs> All right. Yeah, so uh, if you have any time wasters or if you uh, watch either of the ones we suggested this week, please let us know. Anyway, going into our topics, we have several this week. We've got a big agenda. Alex, dun, pertinent dun, to dun, what's dun, happening dun, this dun, week dun, 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 by the time this episode airs. If you didn't guess, we're on about Superman. <laughs> <laughs> no. So Game of Thrones is out this week. It'll be out on Monday. This episode will probably come out on Tuesday. Or Monday. Or Monday, either either. But I was a bit confused by this topic in the agenda because there's so many of them. Mm-hmm. And you're about Game of Thrones, the board game. Yep. There Which is one? currently nine different Game of Thrones board games. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not all of them are called Game of Thrones, but there is nine of them. And there is Game of Thrones Catan coming That's out right, later yeah. this year. So that will make it ten. <laughs> I don't know if it's the first one, but it is what I'd say the most authentic Game of Thrones, the board game experience. This is the one where you have alliances, right? Yeah, so this is the one where you have the map, you take control of one of the Westerosi houses, and then you move your pieces around the map trying to fight for the control of the Westeros and fighting with your opponents Mm. or making alliances and deals. The first time I played this, I was the Greyjoys, and I made an alliance with the Starks, I think. Funnily enough! Enough. That's exactly what happened in our yeah. game. It kind of went okay. <laughs> Except Greyjoys, in our case, backstabbed the Starks. No, uh, I was the Lannister. It was playing four of us, so we had the Lannisters, the Baratheons, the Starks, yeah. and the Greyjoys. And, well, it kind of ended, started with girls versus boys for some reason. It just <laughs> meant to be like that. Uh, but yeah. me and my friend Thori, we were like, Baratheons and Lannisters, practically the fam- same family, right? So we're gonna go, mm. go for this together, and whoever wins the throne, that is all right with us. We're gonna yeah. be all peace and love with this game. And the boys were like, that's not how you play Game of Thrones. What are you talking about? <laughs> you win or you die mm. no 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 we'll get along fine together to, to the point where i would plan to go into territory and be like is that okay if i go there you don't want that she's like no no no, it's fine it's fine you go there i'm like yeah and then i'm gonna go off to, the, to that to that place so you'll be fine you'll have this other place to go and she's like oh yeah okay cool that's fine <laughs> so, in the end she won so i think in the end loves win all but <laughs> So Game of Thrones the board game is what I always wanted the risk to be because there's a lot of map control and gathering your forces and there's a very interesting mechanic where 
the majority of the game, you give orders to the territories you control to where, where you have armies. And your basic orders are to march into the other land, to defend, send support to the adjacent land, to reconciliate power, and I think that that's pretty much it. Oh, and also you can go and rob adjacent territories. I don't remember the, the proper term they used in the book, but... Yeah, like raid. Yeah, raid. Thank you very much, yes. And raid adjacent territories and so on. And you can also have boats, you can have different units of different values, different strengths, and so on. So that part of it is very risk-like. You go, you give them orders, you fight or defend. Fighting is is where your Game of Thrones character comes in because you have different cards with the family members on those cards and they have different abilities. And then you also add all like, the tokens to your fighting value that could have helped you on the map and so on and so on. And that's how you decide who... Uh, wins or loses the fight in the end. But there's also a lot of Game of Thrones stuff, the game, happening behind the scenes because they're also kind of the cards that come into effect that change things about, about the world. There is a bidding system where you can buy for the possession of the free tokens, which are like the sitting on the Game of Thrones, having the Raven or having the Valyrian sword, and all of those things do different different things for the game. But another brilliant thing that while all these mechanics are in place, there is always also an unspoken Game of Thrones behind the people on the table. Because it's surprising how easy it is to kind of even follow into how the books go. And because the map is so well done and the position of the armies and the ways for them to go to achieve their objectives to eventually win the game, they very logically follow and you almost find yourself recreating, without wanting it, the events from the book to a certain extent. Not like everything word by word or not every step you make the same. But like I said, you know, the Starks and Greyjoys made alliances and then the Greyjoys stabbed them in the back. And then the yeah. Baratheons and the Lannisters were together and then the Greyjoys attacked the Lannisters. And you kind of feel like, all right, okay, that, that, that kind of makes sense. Because along with the things that game pushes on you, the politics, you also have politics of you, the player, sitting behind the table and going, well, I've allied myself with this person, but they just put a token on there. Are they planning to march in my territory? Should I protect <laughs> or should I attack them instead? Hmm, should we make alliances or should I break it? Like, there's a whole different level of the game going on on the top of it. And it's really, really good. It does take a lot of time. For the four of us, it took us four hours to play the game. Oh, wow. That is quite a long time. I've mm. definitely played it quicker, definitely. I think it depends how gung-ho you are, maybe. <laughs> yeah. See, we had our Stark at the time was just like, yeah, let's do it. And they just kind of pushed down the map. And it all kind of happened a bit quickly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the thing is with Starks, the north is big, but there isn't much in the north. So they yeah. always have to go down to uh, the neck <laughs> to get some action. And that's yeah. where they meet everyone fighting for their life. So yeah, Game of Thrones... A really beautiful board game, a lot of fun. You don't necessarily need to know anything about Game of Thrones because, as I said, the basic principles of it are very risk-like. So if you know anything about risk or anything about, you know, fighting on the map, using your pawns as warriors, frankly, you don't have to know anything. You can just go on and pretend you know who the Greyjoys and Starks are. It, it doesn't really matter. It's just a really fun, warlike board game where it's not just the fighting that's going on behind the scenes, but there is also a lot of other stuff which makes it really, really brilliant. And I think it's one of the best Game of Thrones translations into a board game format that I have ever played. So, one franchise to another, but we're going to a different media. Joe, what have you watched this week? Yeah, so I went to see the new Planet of the Apes movie, War for the Planet of the Apes. Monkeys! Monkeys! Apes, sorry. Monkeys riding on horses, fighting, talking to each other. It's great. <laughs> um, Andy Circus. <laughs> Andy Circus. Yeah, he's yeah, he's amazing as ever. So yeah, um I don't know what to say about this. It's quite difficult huh. actually. I'm sort of on the fence because firstly, I think it's the weakest of the three, which is actually I feel like I'm a little bit on my own with that because most of the reviews are like saying it's amazing and praising it and, and stuff like this and it's got excellent reviews. So I was kind of like, am I missing something? I don't know. But for me, it felt as an overall film experience, the weakest of the three. That's not to say that it doesn't have amazing parts in it. Like obviously the special effects are absolutely incredible. The 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 way they've created the ape characters are 
unbelievably good. Like there, there's one character, like Maurice, the orangutan. He returns, and he's my favourite of the ape characters. He's brilliant. He's he's the ape, the orangutan that does sign language. All right. Mm-hmm. He's just awesome, and he's a really chill character. He's almost like the counter to Caesar when Caesar's going a bit aggro and vengeful. You know, Maurice. He's kind of like the whoa, whoa chill down kind of kind of character who sort of makes him see sense sometimes. And he's just. They had a few shots where they are tight in on his face, and you can see his eyes, and just the character there is unbelievable. Like the the quality of the animation is absolutely first rate so that's definitely the strongest point of the film um it has some really i don't want to obviously go too much into story details because spoilers and stuff but it has some really interesting story sections where things happen that you don't necessarily expect and andy circus of course is brilliant he just inhabits that role and you fully believe in caesar as a character it's great from that point and woody harrelson is kind of the antagonist he's this colonel who essentially wants to kill caesar and wipe out all of the apes Um, And he's great too. He kind of has that sort of crazy eyed colonel thing down. You know, it seems pretty sort of (laughs) standard, standard fodder for him really. And he does very well. But I couldn't help but feel kind of disappointed. Like for a film with war in the title, you expect a bit more to happen. And there's actually not that much that goes on in terms of like fight scenes, for example. Right? I'm not certainly not trying to say that I want it to just be like all out action, like a dumb Michael Bay film or something, because that's never what these films are. But it felt like there wasn't enough actual physical conflict. There's a few good scenes, like fight scenes, but they're pretty scattered. And really, the film is kind of more a meditation on human and apes approach to warfare in psychological ways. So there's kind of hints about the Holocaust and things like that in there and sort of enforced slavery and and things like that. And it's kind of, yeah, it's interesting and that's good. And I like that they were kind of brave enough to do this and not just follow a typical action movie template. But also it felt like a lacklustre conclusion to the trilogy, really. It kind of ends and that's it. And it sort of feels like what happens at the ending, obviously I won't go into details. It feels a bit neat and a bit, oh, Oh, all right then. That's how it ends. Are they trying to end the franchise, maybe? Yeah, that's the end of the trilogy, basically. Oh, okay, right. Um, that's it's meant to leap lead directly into the Charlton Heston movie now. Oh, okay. Right. And it just kind of I wanted a little bit more. Like I wanted just a little bit more of a really sort of impactful resolution. And to be honest, it kind of splutters out. Oh, right. But you know, it's it's hard, and I don't want to be too negative because actually the film is very good. But so I don't know if maybe I was expecting too much. But it's just after the last one, like I think the second film is the strongest of the trilogy by far. And after that, which was just incredible, this felt definitely like a little bit of a disappointment in terms of the overall story. But obviously having said that, it's an incredible achievement in terms of um, computer animation and scene setting and staging and stuff like that. There's one other thing that's kind of, depending on your your attitude to characters like this, that might you might either like or bother, but there's essentially a, a comedy value value character (laughs) okay (laughs) there's always one of those called bad ape and they kind of come across him and he is he is essentially he's played by steve zahn oh i love steve zahn yeah that kind of gives you a sort of idea of where this character sits so he's you can either find him kind of bumbling and charming and amusing or you might lean more towards the Jar Jar Binks side and find him a little bit irritating. (laughs) I kind of hovered between the two. There were times where I thought, yeah, okay, yeah, he's quite a sweet character. And then there were times where I was just like, oh, for goodness sake, just you're Mm. at war, deal with it, you know? (laughs) So yeah, so it's really hard because it is good. It's worth seeing. It's worth seeing on a big screen. But I feel like a lot of people might be slightly disappointed in the conclusion, maybe. So it's kind of, yeah, it's good. It could have been great, if that makes sense. <laughs> I've never seen... I, I watched the... What was the first one in this series called? The first one was um, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Oh, and the second one? Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. <laughs> All their very original names. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've seen Rise. I wasn't that fast. There's a whole thing with uh, Tom Felton's character, which like... Uh, Wait, Tom Felton? Was... Yeah, that was it in Rise. He was kind of like um, this... The dick. This knob. Isn't he always a knob? <laughs> yeah, he's kind of... <laughs> when Caesar is in captivity, basically, um, in the first film, he just kind of tortures him a bit. And it's kind of... He's sort of almost the instigator as to why Caesar wants to stand up against humans and stuff. But then... 
you look at the last film, uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, with, which had Koba, the character of Koba, the other ape, who was just an amazing character and was like a real true antagonist to Caesar. And that film was just kind of, I just thought that was great. And obviously Rise of the Planet of the Apes, the first film, you had James Franco in it. You know, that was the origin story basically for Caesar. And it's a very, and that's a very good film. But Dawn, the second yeah. one, I just thought elevated it. And there was just awesome character conflict. The action was great. And it was just overall a really, really great action film. And this one, yeah, it's fine. But I wanted a bit more. I just wanted, I wanted it to take my breath away a little bit more than it actually did. So maybe it says more about me that maybe I'm a little bit jaded. I don't know. But I was kind of just like, oh, I miss that kind of. It's it's great. It's it's good. It's fine. The you know the quality of the film is definitely amazing. And I have a lot of time for Matt Reeves, the director, because obviously he did Cloverfield, and oh, yeah. um, you know he's he's definitely a good director. But yeah, oh, I just wanted a little a little bit more. And they didn't want to link it into the Tim Burton one. No, uh, funny no, enough, no. no. Yeah, see, that's no. the one thing. That's why I don't want to be too harsh on this because we've had a terrible Planet of the Apes movie, which you know Tim Burton gave us, and this yeah. is not that. This is absolutely far superior to that in every single way. It is a great, it is a good movie. It's really worth seeing, but it's just not for me. It just wasn't. It didn't hit the heights of the last one. Should I watch it? I think should so. If you if you like yeah. the other two, I think you should see it. I've only seen one. Oh, well, you should probably watch the second one first because <laughs> <laughs> this one follows directly on from that. So. I went to a little event last week. Have either of you watched the YouTuber Ashens before? No. No. So this dude, he so he's got two channels. He's got Ashens and Barshens. So he does Barshens with a guy called Barry who has um, My Virgin Kitchen as well. Um, and they review stuff. But um, the main channel, Ashens, is a dude, camera pointed at his brown sofa. All you see is his hands and he reviews Tat. <laughs> Or old video game random stuff. Good, like, legit consoles and all the knockoff stuff. Like, uh, some of his most popular series are him uh, reviewing Tat from Poundland and associated kind of shops. So uh, he created a little event called Beyond the Tube. So it's him and another YouTuber called Eli, uh, Eli Silverman. They create this show that's going around the co- uh, country called Beyond the Tube. So they come up, they do some of their usual shtick, and then there's also um, a couple of comedy performers there. So just a couple bits of stand-up. So I went to the one in London last week. It was very, very fun. Ended up on stage, involved in one of the little se- segments. Always fun. There was one comedian there, Beck Hill, which was absolutely fantastic. She's an Australian comic. She was just generally funny, but she has this shtick where she has an easel and kind of like a big craft paper flip chart, but she's made them like kind of interactive pop-up books. If you remember pop-up books where you used to pull certain things. Yeah. Yeah. So she creates a song about a topic and then creates the pop-up book to go with it plays a song and does it all and there was one about elon musk <laughs> how he is a super villain yeah i can buy that like i can see him as a super villain absolutely and it was just so amazing i think uh, she's at the fringe and possibly at the Udderbelly soon but if you get a chance to see Beck Hill do it, she is amazing. The other comedian, Ash Firth, he was pretty good as well. He had this whole thing about names of the protagonists in action movies. Can you guess what the the, the main name of action movie protagonists is? The male ones. John. Yes. Yeah. 100%. John. So most of them are called John. John Matrix, John McClane, and so on and so forth. John Wick. John Wick. So he had pie charts for all the major action stars and like what names they had. <laughs> then he made these uh this like name generator box that he was passed around through the crowd and he had to pick out one name from the left, one from the right. So first name you got very standard names. So like my one was Harry, and then you got something stupid or descriptive. It's like some of them are like Harry Hunter. Nice. Matt Max Steel. <laughs> Max Steel, love it. So manly. <laughs> I think Max Steel's actually a cartoon character. Could well be. <laughs> but like think about Chuck Norris's names, like a lot of them is Chuck. Yeah, he doesn't need he doesn't need character names. He's just Chuck Norris. Walker Texas Ranger. He walks a lot. So it's kind of <laughs> on the nose there. But like all the names are really, really manly. Like first name quite generic. Second name, man. Yeah. But that was really fun. And there was uh, live reviews of different items. I had to order 
these really, really crap knockoff DVDs in order of IMDb rating. That was quite hard. It's like A Car's Life. Oh, God. Braver. Braver was one. Uh, there was another one which was... It was a knockoff of Up. Nice. Was it called Down? <laughs> oh, but this guy had like a magic amulet which changed his house into a balloon. It's like, dude... What? <laughs> Why do you need an ambulance? Braver has nothing to do with Brave. No. They just package it that way. It's actually a Christmas story. It's like Asylum movies. They're great. Asylum movie knockoffs. Oh, God. Like Transmorphers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, magic. Oh, God. Yeah, so it is utterly fantastic. Um, they do have some YouTube videos up, which we'll put the link in the show notes to see what they're going on about. But yeah, uh, it's going around the country. If you get a chance to see it, go see it. Uh, it's very, very fun. Very, very good. Very interesting and funny, if I didn't say that already. Yeah funny all right back to board games so alex what other board game have you been playing yeah i'll bring all the board games this week to the Woo! yard there's nothing wrong with that i don't know my butts bring all the board games to the yard no that don't work <laughs> uh, it kind of did it kind of did Star for effort so i'm gonna talk about dice forge which is my new board game love you guys okay i really really love it so it it is incredibly simple it is a dice building game so you'll have your starting dice you roll the dice you get the values from the dice which either gold two resources or victory points you mark them on your progression tracker and then you can either use your gold to buy different sides for the dice to make your dice better or you can use your resources to buy cards that have victory points and you have 10 terms and by the end of the 10th round whoever's got the most point wins so incredibly simple yet it is so good it is so well thought out and it's so beautiful and the dice is sort of made out of this dice frame that has the plastic clip-ons that fit perfectly and take off perfectly off the dice you exchange them pretty much every round and you have to think which side you want to put here where do i want to maximize my gain there's a lot less probability mathing going on than you think. It is way simpler than that, that you don't have to be some kind of mass genius and calculate all the crazy probabilities. No, this game is very simple. But also, every component is just so, so gorgeous. The box, everything within the box fits in the box. Every single piece has its place. Literally, as soon as you open the box and place everything, the laying out the game and then packing the game back up is the easiest thing in the world. So is with the board. You know exactly where to put your cards because the board has a dent in there to symbolize where the cards go. You know exactly where to store your tokens because there's a dent in a box for your tokens. You know exactly <laughs> where to fit the extension to your resource tracker. Again, because there's like a dent that tells you and everything feels perfectly and the dice are all made perfectly and it is just it is board game porn y'all <laughs> it is so good and it is so unbelievably simple but then there is also so unbelievably strategic because cards on top of having victory points also have additional abilities and it's which combination of these abilities can I use to maximize my gain from the roll and every turn you always doing something because Players all roll the dice, it is maximum four players, and you roll the dice at the same time. But then you only have one active player, and that active player gets to do stuff. So either buy upgrades to his dice or buy more cards. And then the next turn begins, everyone rolls the dice, and then there is a new active player, and he repeats the same thing. And it's really fast, it's really simple, really beautiful, and it's just a brand new shiny thing, and I've never wanted a board game more in my life. <laughs> It is so beautiful and so gorgeous. And it, the thing that currently that are my thing in board games, the really simple rules and premise that allows you to be incredibly strategic. And this game certainly does that. And there was another game that I reviewed before called Century Spice Road that did exactly the same. Game of Thrones, the board game, for example. You can spend at least 30 minutes explaining to everyone the rules. And yeah, when you come to that and when you get like over all the minute rules, they're very, they're quite simple to understand. But there is a lot of them and there is a lot of minute things for you to remember and to take into account. These guys, simple. You do two things. But with those two things, you can do so much. It's unbelievable. Anyway, I'm going to stop on my Dice Forge love fest. I'm hoping that maybe I can review it at some point on the bigger battle. So then you can see all the pretty pictures of the board game. Because did I mention it's pretty? It's pretty. <laughs> You are a sucker for a pretty board game, though. I am, but this board game does have something to back that up as well. Like, it's not just be, it's not just about being pretty. It's also a lot of fun, and it is so well made that that just adds to its overall prettiness. Can't say anything about that. Joe, I'm wondering, is 
is this as pretty as Alex's board game? Because you've been watching something this week again. I wouldn't say it's pretty, but it's pretty damn great. <laughs> <laughs> and that's The Leftovers. Is this the one with... Oh, God damn it. Justin um, Theroux? Ma- that's it. Oh, my God. I love that guy as well. What is wrong with my brain? It's morning. It's fine. It's <laughs> perfectly acceptable. So, yeah. So, The Leftovers is back. We've got the final season available at the moment. Um, I think all all episodes are available right now on, like, Sky Services and Now TV and stuff like that. Is it season three or season two? Because season two... This is season out. three. Oh, right. Okay. This is season three, which is the final. It, it's going to end. Um, So, the, the first season uh, was based on a book by Tom Perotta, and it essentially covers what happens after this global event which they call the sudden departure which is a completely unexplained disappearance of uh, 2% of the world's population so essentially like 150 whatever million people just completely disappear um, like into the ether they're just gone the first season kind of explores what happens after that what the a- aftermath is so obviously what's the effect on religion and cults emerge so there's this one cult called the guilty remnant it's like we talked about last week about the book and actually a bit today one global event yeah that changes exactly the society that is like ours yeah but the the this change is so big that it completely changes them as well it is a what if book oh, again <laughs> completely and so they kind of they focus on some key individual people and stuff really that's kind of a, a metaphor for sort of uh the global community as a whole so what's quite interesting with this show is like the first season i i loved it i thought it was incredible like it was completely unlike anything else on TV because of the way it was telling its story it was it was not afraid to take its time and really focus on character and not just fill itself with action and stuff but you were still completely hooked as to what was happening and the first season covered the entirety of the book and then after that, they essentially rebooted the entire show. But wait, is the book a series or the book is just this? It's just because... one book. It's just one book, I believe, called The Leftovers. Because I watched the first season and then I started second season and it was really good. But for some reason, I got busy, I think, probably watching some other crap <laughs> that I was <laughs> yeah. watching. And I, and I jumped off because, you know, my brain works that way. But to me, the ending of the first series, it felt unfinished. Exactly, yeah. So it's kind of... I think they departed departed huh? <laughs> uh, slightly from the actual ending that's in the book I haven't read the book but I think they kind of knew that they wanted the TV series to continue and so they kind of left it a bit more open than perhaps the book does I'm not totally sure like I said haven't read the book what, what was kind of interesting is that even though the first season was absolutely acclaimed and everyone loved it I don't think it performed that well in terms of in terms of viewership I also don't think everyone loved it Joe yeah I think it was kind of like people weren't quite sure what to make of it it had some strong points but then it also had it was a bit falling off the rock in some places it was it was very uneven like there was lots of really great parts yeah but then there were also big mis- missteps in that as well for me I loved that it was doing something different and it was interesting yeah um but then yeah they essentially for season two like completely rebooted the show they changed the, obviously the characters remain the same but it picked them up moved them to a totally different location and the the intro music changed the title sequence and generally the tone of the show kind of changed and it was a very wise thing to do and the show has been all the better for it ever since and now it's kind of universally acclaimed and yeah it's really interesting and we're into the final season now so we're kind of trying to kind of uh, come together and sort of see how people are gonna react to this sort of long term I haven't finished the season yet I'm probably about halfway through and it's written by Dave and Lindelof, Lindelof from Lost. Mm-hmm. So I'm not mm. expecting an actual conclusion in terms of I don't <laughs> think <laughs> I don't think it'll ever be explained in the show what the departure actually was. Maybe it will, I don't know. From where I was standing with the show, I yeah. think the departure the departed are almost irrelevant. Yeah, they are. To me, yeah. the whole show was about how do people deal with with loss. Yes. And yeah. when you lose someone, there is almost always nothing yeah. that will give you a satisfactory answer as why that person is not there anymore. Exactly. Like, it could be a completely legitimate reason, but for you, because this is your loved one, it doesn't matter. And I think maybe that's what was, that show was trying to say as well. Yeah, I think you're absolutely on the money. Um, They kind of, in this season, people have been talking about, well, we know what it was. It was just the rapture. Yeah, that's it. You know, it's fine. And it's kind of almost, I feel like maybe that's... I, I, 
like I say, I haven't watched the end yet, so I don't know. Maybe they will kind of go, ha ha, it was aliens all along. Yay. Ha um, Who knows? Who knows? But Please as no. I say, I hope not. <laughs> considering it's Damon Lindelof, um, he has form in this area for not actually concluding things. So I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not expecting like a grand resolution, but I still love the show. The performances are completely excellent. Justin Threw is brilliant in it. Christopher Eccleston is great. Liv Tyler's in it. She's awesome. It's just a, it's a great different, unique, well-written, well-characterised and performed show that asks interesting questions and kind of isn't afraid to go on random detours, which is quite refreshing. Like, you know, I'm really enjoying the new Twin Peaks at the moment. And so I like a show that isn't afraid to kind of go, yeah, you know what, for this episode, we're going to go to Australia and we're going to follow this dude's dad for the entire episode and see what he's getting up to. And it fits in with the whole story arc of the entire season, but it's still kind of brave to take yourself away from the main characters of the show. <laughs> he's the showrunner for uh, what the new Watchmen series. Oh, right. Cool. Yeah, he yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Which mm. I think the series is just a, such a bit better idea than a movie has ever been. Terry Gilliam wanted to do a series years ago for it. I do quite like the movie. The Watchmen movie, I've got a little mm. bit of a yeah, soft spot yeah, for that movie. Yeah. yeah, that'd be good. But yeah, so anyway, back to The Leftovers. It's it's really worth watching if you like your TV shows a little bit more sort of intelligent and kind of, you know, the, the, the sort of take the time and let you kind of just soak it all in sort of thing but yeah, yeah it's really good really worth watching and for me it kind of redeemed Damon Lindelof because I was kind of in a mood with him after Prometheus I was like dude you know <laughs> not after Lost well I didn't watch all of Lost because I oh, knew yeah, what was going to happen oh yeah of course I didn't sorry I forgot I watched the first season of Lost and I was like yeah I can see how this is going to go and I just ditched it <laughs> I was like I just do not have time in my life for this <laughs> And I'm kind of glad I did. <laughs> any show that uses any songs by Richard Cheese is good for me, so I think I'm going to watch these. <laughs> so yeah, so I was kind of like, well, Damon, I'm going to give you a shot with this show because it sounds interesting. And it is great. So I would say that he needs to stick to TV, stop messing around, don't ever go back to the <laughs> Alien franchise, stay away. <laughs> Leave my babies alone, Damon <laughs> and And yeah, so it's good. So yeah, it's worth watching if you have access to the Sky things and Now TV and stuff, which is only like seven quid a month. So do it. So what is where is that originally? Is it an HBO show or Showtime? It is. Yeah, it's, it's HBO. It's an HBO show. Yeah, because. I think what I'm loving lately about all the TV series that are coming out and that includes Leftovers, American Gods, and so on and so mm. on, is that they're walking away from this very pragmatic structure of the show, yeah. which I absolutely love. They're not afraid to say, our viewers are intelligent. They can go on the detour with us yeah. and they can understand how the de- that detour will be worth it in a long while. Exactly, and I think yeah. that's an absolutely a right way to go. I'm currently binge-watching an incredibly pragmatic probably we'll talk about it at some point incredibly pragmatic show the show that has had so many seasons it has run out of all ideas <laughs> kind of energy and whatsoever and i have no clue why it's still going and still popular and just seeing those side by side makes me what show is that oh, Grey's anatomy <laughs> oh, we'll, get, we'll get to there we'll, we'll get there you know there's room there's room for all types of shows this is the thing like twin peaks has been amazing the new twin peaks is brilliant but unfortunately hardly anybody's bloody watching it like I, what? I read a thing that said that more people watched Keeping Up with the Kardashians than The Return of Twin Peaks, uh. and that just made me die inside. It is quite hard to get into. It's, it's a little niche. It's got its cult following, but its cult following came like the following came after the show because they tried to change stuff halfway through the season. Like, we could go on and on about the whole hoo ha with the original Twin Peaks. But yeah, yeah, it is very niche. So I'm I'm three episodes in. I just haven't had time to keep up with it. It's so good. It's like the opening. I think it was in the second episode. Like what happened? I was like, oh my god, is he either first or second? Mm. Um, what happened on the sofa? Oh yeah, I mean, crazy. Yeah. Oh god, that's just peak Lynch. Like there's an episode that you won't have seen yet, which is the one previous to the one that's just been out. That was just essentially David Lynch at his absolute best for an hour. It was like mm. a ahead and wild at heart all kind of melded together in the most incredible hour of tv i've seen in a long time um and it was completely experimental sort of stuff and i was kind of thinking you know what it's a shame that not more people are watching it but i'm glad it exists and i'm glad that showtime made you know went and sort of said yeah okay we're gonna do this we're gonna take a chance on this because it's just it's david lynch at his utter best right now so oh, i adore him it's yeah it's it's brilliant it's so good did you ever watch his like i don't know if he still does it i haven't checked but he used to do this thing every single morning where he'd sit have a cup of coffee and tell people the time and the weather 
<laughs> that's brilliant. That was it. That's every brilliant. single day, every single morning, he tell you the time and the weather, and oh, that was I it. I don't know if he still does that. Yeah, might have to look that up. But yeah, I love, I love David Lynch. I've got all the time in the world for him because he's like a true auteur. You know, you can tell a David Lynch film from any other. He has a completely unique style and methodology, and the world needs more filmmakers that are like that. That will kind of sow their, own, you know, go their own way and be like, yeah, I'm going to make this hour long episode of primetime TV, and I'm going to be totally experimental and weird with it, and you're just gonna like it you know it's yeah. kind of great love him yeah basically less generic and pragmatic stuff but yeah. unfortunately i do feel like we we are in the minority who love that stuff yeah. everyone else There's everyone else just both. switches tv when they're having dinner or they're bored and have nothing to do there isn't you know what i'll it's it's the rant i'm saving for when the game of thrones finally comes out we'll get to it let's move on i mean yeah th- this thing. There's, there's room for both types of tv uh you know there's there's room for all sorts and i while i love twin peaks and things like the leftovers i also really enjoy stuff like i zombie so you know it, there's room for everything yeah you know what but i zombie it it still has something. It is not as generic. There's generic parts to it. Yeah. But there is also a lot of thought and intelligence in that show more than the average show of that format would yeah. ever have. So I don't think you can exactly put them. No, on the same perhaps plate. not. I used to watch a lot of CSI. That was definitely generic. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that that is the plate I was talking about. <laughs> but yes, leftovers good. Watch it. Okay, we'll do. We'll do. Right. If you watch it, let us know your favorite bits and how uh, attractive Justin Theroux is. He is very attractive and he takes his shirt off a lot. Why didn't you just say that? Uh, yeah, that that'll make everyone watch it. He takes his top off all the time. So I looked on the Wikipedia page and like one of the first pictures, he's there, he's got a girl kind of behind him. It was like, nah, yeah. he's got his shirt off. Thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. And he's got a nice beard. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, it's all good. Speaking of nice beards, um I went to see some wrestling on Thursday night. And there's some quite spectacular beards there. <laughs> so I, I went to uh, the debut um, night of Anarchy Pro Wrestling called Anarchy at the Amersham, which is the Amersham Arms Down uh, by New Cross in London. Uh, they are doing events around the country. So if you get a chance to see this uh, promotion, do it. It was so much fun. It's in a back room of a pub, which is uh, <laughs> weird. <laughs> like the, It was a weird pub um, at loads of different levels, little like nooks and crannies. And you just go through this door, just like another the bar area it's like pillars and stuff and then there's a ring it's a small ring so it's 14 by 14 instead of 18 by 18 and at one point during a chairs match one of the wrestlers picked up the chair went to swing it over his head to hit the other guy and hit the speakers (laughs) ouch I actually don't know which 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 I feel more painful about. The could have been worse. Hit, hit on the chair by a head or the. TV, you could have hit someone in the audience. Of, that could have been worse. I did actually have to pull a chair out of the ring at one point. <laughs> it was uh, Rob Lynch from the London Riot and Alexander Ro- uh, Roth. Alexander Roth did jump from the turnbuckle and hit. Um, Rob Lynch while he was sitting on a chair, and the chair just kind of collapsed under him and just crumpled. So you just see the ref just like kicking it to the side of the ring. And it got to me because I was stood by one of the turnbuckles because A, I'm short as hell. So I can't see over everyone. (laughs) And B, I wanted to see some people getting hit. So I pulled the chair out and that was quite fun. But the the reason I was there, my friend's brother was wrestling. His name's Dylan D'Angelo and he was having a tables match with the other half of the London Riot, James Davis. And it was spectacular. So is this like... You have to excuse my noobness here. I'm not a fan of wrestling. I don't like, I don't watch anything violent, like in real life kind of thing. I don't like boxing or wrestling or anything like that. Is this kind of like actual wrestling or the fake kind, you know, the, the like theatre wrestling? All wrestling is real. It's essentially a soap opera with violence. Yeah. To the point that Dylan went through a table. He can't, he still can't walk today. <laughs> he went through a table on Thursday. I shared a tweet of um him going through the table and uh he was slightly off center so he's meant to go straight through yeah like he knew he was going th- through the table breaking kayfabe here like we were talking about it afterwards he was meant to go straight through the table it was all prepared but something happened i think because the ring was smaller maybe he might have threw off like the logistics or something but you saw james davis had him right he had him the right way rotated him correctly but something happened and he went diagonally oh. and the back of his calves hit the corner of the table Ow. like right where the legs attached Ow. yeah so like his calves were on fire and 
we were speaking to him afterwards because the changing room was upstairs. We went to check on him. We had to help him out of his like pads. He couldn't get down the stairs. He had to be carried up the stairs to get down the stairs. Like, do you remember when you were a kid and you used to bump down the stairs on your bum? Yeah, in a pillowcase. Yeah. Oh, just like kind of bumping down anyway. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he had to do that to get down the stairs. I was quite surprised he managed to get in the beer garden with because that was up two flights of stairs. That was impressive. That was utterly fantastic match. There was um, a no hold bar match. Well, it was meant to be just a singles match, but we came in from the garden and uh, there was tacks all over the ring, like push pins. Oh. Uh, so someone got dropped onto that. Oh, I don't like it. It's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> The chairs match was pretty good. There was a really good singles match with RJ Singh and Connor Mills. Speaking to RJ Singh later on. He's a, again, breaking kayfabe. He's a deputy head teacher, which was pretty cool. So we were chatting. Oh yeah, I was at Paris evening tonight and now I'm uh, beating someone up. Brilliant. (laughs) And I got a lovely drawing from Charlie Peterson from one of the first matches. So he was beaten up by this other other guy who's meant to be like a... uh, Ponzi Toff, he came out with a gold champagne bottle and spoons, like a silver spoon in his mouth. <laughs> that was it. So this big, gruff kind of... You can imagine him running around in blooming Doc Martens, killing, like kicking people's teeth in. But he came around at the end and he just had these drawings of the Amish in arms with him like breaking out of it. And he's like, yeah, I'll have one of your drawings. That's cool. So like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you ever get a chance to... Uh, if you are interested in that kind of violence like it is it's so popular yeah i don't think it's for me i think i'd be covering my eyes the whole time (laughs) oh it was amazing yeah check out anarchy pro wrestling really really good franchise really good night non-stop matches check them out absolutely yeah so that was something a bit different i did this week and um alex you were bookending this show So bringing it back to the start, we're talking about some more Game of Thrones. And this is an old school one. We've spoken about this before. Yeah, I was talking about it when it first came out and I couldn't play it anymore. So basically it's Telltale's Game of Thrones. The reason why we're talking about it is because it's this month's PS Plus game. So I'm suffering for all of you so you don't have to because it's literally what this game is. (laughs) I spoke about it before that we stopped basically playing because it was glitchy as hell. Yeah. It is uh, considerably less glitchy right now. I have to say I've not really encountered any problems whatsoever in its performance. However, and I'll get to the minor things that annoy me before I get to the one major thing that really frustrates me. So, uh, you know, the models are your telltale models that don't that look crap. I'm sorry. There's no other way to put it. I was playing an indie what like indie um, narrative game a couple of months ago that pretty much looked better than Telltale. Yeah. In its outlook. And also for this game, they took a very interesting stylistic approach in the sense that all their backgrounds look like oil paintings. They're kind of styled that way. Yeah. But what that means is that pretty much everything is kind of blurry and kind of dirty and messy and unattractive. And it really rubs me the wrong way because I know in Game of Thrones, and it is most certainly based itself after the TV series and not the book because it has characters molded after the actors and they're also doing the voiceover for their characters in the in the game so yes it's definitely modeled after the tv series and tv series yeah there is a lot of gray and muddy stuff is but it is also incredibly and astonishingly beautiful with the way it does and i don't mean just the sets where they are and locations i mean they also think about colors mm. if there's something gray it's not boring gray it's beautiful gray i am um, i follow the uh production designer on instagram of game of thrones and yeah he mm. posts concept art for locations costumes and stuff like that and some of it is just oh it's just stunning like yeah the color and the patterns and things like that so telltale game of friends did kind of look a bit brown from what i saw (laughs) yeah it just looks brown and dirty and unattractive and it really frustrates me because there are like a couple of really beautiful scenes like where the knife watch goes to take their wows next to weirwood tree Mm. that was like really beautiful scene and i liked how the weirwood tree was drawn and how it all looked but that you know that was easy they're like wearing black clothes there's white snow everywhere and there's a pink tree like that is so easy to do of course it looks beautiful but when they have to do kind of the greedy brown and gray stuff it just like looks they splashed a little dirt on the screen Uh. and didn't wipe it up properly because it's all blue blurring in each other and that's annoying but you know what i can get over that i play a lot of telltale games they're not always the best well actually they're never the best of looking games out there but it's fine i can get on board with that however what annoys me 
more than anything is that they clearly went like a stupid approach to Game of Thrones. I'm sorry, they kind of... You know when you go... When, when someone who has not watched Game of Thrones uh, walks up to you and is like, Yes, what's Game of Thrones about? Oh, and because God, you kind yeah. of have to explain it in a couple of words, you go, Well, there's a lot of death. People say fuck a lot. There is a lot of Boops. naked people. There aren't a lot of naked people in this in this game. But, and like, these are kind of the very generic things that Game of Thrones is is famous by. And it seems that this is what the game thought it would be. Because you've got your foresters who are kind of the Starks off of the game, but they're, they're better meant to the Starks and it all happens after the Red Wedding. So if you watch the show, you know kind of the timescale I'm talking about or mm. read the books. And the foragers are trying to survive in a world where they are completely outnumbered and they're put in the position where everyone is stronger than them and no one cares about them and everyone just wants their stuff. And the point, and the thing is, the foresters are this white, fluffy, good people. And yeah, kind of occasionally they have to do some tough stuff, but overall, they're clearly the good guys. And then they have all the people who, like the White Hills, who are the neighbors who always wanted to control of their wood, which is a special wood out of every ship and shield is made in Westeros. And they are so clearly bad with like zero redeeming features whatsoever. They're absolutely disgustingly bad. And the game doesn't even make it subtly, there is a lot of outrageous characters in Game of Thrones, but they have a way about them when they speak, where they don't basically go, well, you're mum, <laughs> which is what this White Hill characters basically do. Mm. All their insults is so incredibly childish and thoughtless, they're so evil that you can't just be, but you're boiling with rage at them. And I know there's a lot of evil characters in Game of Thrones. Yeah, but they kind of, they're, they're not painted in shades of black and white. White, like the no, characters in the, in the show, like even the Lannisters, right, who are the villains essentially, they still have some redeeming features, like their love for their family uh, in more ways than one, um, well, okay. their uh, their loyalty to each other, and things like that. So, but you know, like even Ramsay, right? He's a horrible, horrible character. We think he's Joffrey 2.0, but if you know the backstory, you know how he's been treated. Exactly. You can yeah. kind of see, yes, that's how one would turn that poor child into a monster, like. Ramsay. Ramsey. So you see, but these guys are just plain evil. It's just lazy. No explanation. Plain, horribly, and hiding evil, and it frustrates me to the point because I feel like I'm okay with being put in tough situations and being in, and having to make tough decisions, and that's what I actually like about this game. The decisions that you have to make are really, really tough, and I have to think literally about every word I say, I have to think about it, and that process I like, but it always feels like I'm just banging my head off to a tall brick wall of these evil characters that, no matter what, are just gonna do evil stuff. Mm. You need some nuance with that. You can't just be evil for evil's sake. No. Especially yeah. in Westeros. The greatest villains in all sorts of things, films, TV, games, whatever, they all have shades to them. They're, they're never just oh, yeah. totally black or white or evil or good. There's always shades. So, yeah. yeah. I know. So, yeah. So, it is really frustrating to me. However, if there is one redeeming quality is that I'm actually kind of interested in where the story is going. Whereas with New Marvel's Guardian of the Galaxy Telltale series, I could not give a flying toss how <laughs> the story ends of these characters. But with this one, I'm kind of curious of where they go and where each character is going to end up and what is in store for them. It is interesting to me from th that point of view. And I'm kind of interested where they will fit within the... Game of Thrones canon story because they can't the thing is they can't really change that much because the canon story is going by themselves without those Forester dudes so it's all really just about them and their family and the overall they, they can't really influence the big play of the game it's, it is about them and I think that's kind of sweet and nice in a way because that was a really clever decision you want to care for that family and it's that their little world and they might not be very important but they are important to you to the player but I just think that the the, the writers, I, I really hate saying it because I know how much effort it is put into writing and some of the things are actually really nicely done and I like the decisions in it. But just making an atrociously, infuriatingly bad guy is not a good solution for the game. This is not Game of Thrones. Just because there's a guy that murders everyone right, left and center, this is not Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is not that simple and mm. you made it so incredibly simple and so on the nose simple, it's even like the most 
challenging pers- person is gonna hit in the nose that that guy is an ass. Mm, that's a shame. It is. So I personally wouldn't say wouldn't don't play the game. It's for free, so I mean that's your justification. But the only thing in- so far I'm enjoying is the hard decisions I have to make, and I'm faintly curious as to where the story is going to go. Everything else makes me infuriated on a minute by minute basis. Hmm. No, I just um, I remember we were discussing it. Um... Like, the mechanics were really janky and, uh, like, not in keeping with some of the uh, Telltale's later games. But since it's free, uh, go out, try it, let us know what you think. And you could do so in a variety of different ways. So you could do so on the forums, bigredbarrel.com. You could do so on Twitter, at Big Red Barrel, and use the hashtag Geekspeak. You can use our personal Twitters. I am at the Sweet Shrimp. I am at to the underscore. I am at Pixel Ritual. You can also go into the YouTube channel, leave a comment on the videos that are up weekly. You can also go to iTunes, leave a little comment. Five star rating would be great, that would be nice, but whatever you think we deserve. We have a few little shout outs as well. Alex, do you want to do the forums? Thank yous to Dermot, Richard Kirk, Stingo, and Stealthy Joe. And Joe, do you want to do the Twitter? Yes, uh, big hugs and Twitter love to Will Driver at Will Driver 93 and Matt at underscore M317. You can also come and see, well, at least Alex live in person if you go to Tabletop Tuesday every Tuesday in Loading Bar in Dalston. That's the scenario bar. We have a special event called Tabletop Tuesday. Every week we have a new featured game which you can win that very evening all you have to do is play the game tell us you played the game and your name gets put into a prize draw by 10 p.m that very evening it could be yours what is the featured game this week alex before i go into that big shout out to todd who is a podcast listener and who's traveled all the way from california to attend tabletop tuesday nice Yay! be more Ooh, like todd yeah um, <laughs> but uh, honestly really really great to see uh, listeners come to tabletop and mm, uh, enjoy very the nice. event our next tabletop tuesday event is actually going to be really great we have dark Souls the board game so you might remember it pretty much broke the Kickstarter when it launched yeah Uh, it is Dark Souls leaf through to the bone it has beautiful minis Uh, it has an interesting AI mechanic the box is absolutely huge it's yeah, taking it's, half it's of my living unreal. room right yeah. now. <laughs> and uh, it is one of the biggest prizes we've ever given away during the Tabletop Tuesday. Nice. Yeah, that's that's like... Because it's a very expensive game. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I think it's like 100 quid now. Go and see if you can win one. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Although my, my favourite Tabletop Tuesday prize was... I did get a chocolate skull a couple of years ago before nice. I joined the company. I love that skull. Go play the game. Go try and win the game. I might actually turn up to play it. It's a good game. It's, it is worth playing. It's really good. What I'm going to say is that because the game is quite long, we're not. no one's going to be playing the full version on the night yeah, because we're obviously trying to enough. give as many people as we can the opportunity to enter into a prize draw. So we're going to be playing small demos, but one of the copies will always be in the bar. So uh, even if you don't get to play the full game on this Tuesday, you can come later and pick it up and play four of it. Oh, tell them to put it somewhere safe. God. Cause people, I'll tell Jesse to yeah, look after it. Because, oh my god, it would be heartbreaking to just like lose pieces and stuff from that game. And also, on the same week, we're going to give away our uh, video game themed goodies because we have had four or five weeks now of board games that were kind of based on video games. So anyone who's come on the night and played a feature game was entered into that prize draw. So you should come and win that because there's a lot of awesome stuff in that video game goodie bag. Awesome. Right, so head over to that. Go check out Tabletop Tuesday. Go play games let us know if there's anything you want to know about the game also you can go to bigredbarrel.com top left hand corner of the front page there is a static post all about the event this week and it has a list of uh, most of the board games there there are a lot of board games at scenario so that's the place to be oh yes cookies and booze go watch it oh yeah yeah Play yep. Mass Effect Andromeda. It's Don't awesome. let that put you off. It's still entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think, Joe? Because you've not played it before, have you? Oh, the game looks like garbage. I'm definitely not going to play the game. <gasps> but <laughs> but wow. I am enjoying you guys playing wow. it. Wow. Hurt. I'm hurt. <laughs> I, w- I got quite an uplifting feeling because we played through that opening sequence. And by the way, the first, the opening sequence and the first planet are not the best parts of the game, which is why did you do that Bioware? I don't know, but, <laughs> but they are not. And we, we kind of went, uh, we kind of sat together and she's like, oh, you know what? I'm quite, quite really impressed. And I had like all uplifting feelings that she might like the game. And you're like, 
The game is garbage. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm so glad that Julia's enjoying it and it's really cool. And I do really enjoy watching you guys play it. But yeah, I just, I'm just i watching it going, this would annoy me intensely. It just, nah, it's not for me. Well, yeah, we did have Liam for the first mission. Oh, he's, he's annoying a... us. <gasps> yeah, can you just arrange to get him killed as soon as possible, please? Um, he doesn't get killed, but we just oh, won't take sake. him as our Yeah, uh, just leave him behind member. all the time. We'll take the cool ones. Yeah, and every Drac, opportunity, leave Liam PB behind. And Vetra. <laughs> And Jal, so all the aliens, because they're cool. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, just, yeah, it didn't, like Mass Effect 2, which is the one that I was playing and then stopped halfway through because something else came out that I wanted to play, is like amazing, like the story grips you straight away and it was cool and the combat was great and I loved how it looked, but this one I was just like, Ugh. But then, you know, I'm not I'm not really a Mass Effect super fan, so it's hard to say. That's yeah, fine. Mm. As long as you're enjoying the stream, it's all good. Oh, yeah. I enjoy watching you guys play, and it's fun to chat with the guys in the community and stuff, so it's really cool. I mean, uh, there's not going to be a stream this Sunday, which is irrelevant for this podcast. So the Sunday, before this podcast comes out, there is not going to be a stream because uh, Julia is celebrating the birthday with her lovey Debbie. Aww. But after that, we're back. Awesome. Um, also, upcoming uh, 100th episode, it looks like it's going to be, uh, we're going to be recording the weekend of the 5th. Uh, hopefully doing a live stream with <gasps> that with uh, special guest stars. So expect a well-lubricated <laughs> podcast. Yeah, what? I'll say something. <laughs> Alcohol. Yeah, it means we'll all be drunk. Not the other oh. kind of lubrication. <laughs> Guys, it's too early. It's too early for this. I can't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we are going to be streaming. If you are in the London vicinity, we will be at Secret Weapon doing so. We will tweet out more details at near the time. And uh, we may be going to watch the sunrise afterwards as oh, celebration. God. Yeah, so for episode 97 of Big Red Bar Geek Speak, I have been Lauren. I have been Butts. I have been Joe. And we bid you goodbye. Bye. Bye. I need a better outro as Butts. well. you and your ears are quite welcome for the podcasting goodness that you just heard why not roll on over to bigredbarrel.com for more podcasts news reviews and videos from the biggest Read a site on the internet, BigRedBarrel.com. Because it has a lot of elements from the risk. Oh, God. Sorry, my phone's ringing. Hang on. Hello? Hello, can I ring you back? I'm just recording a podcast. What's a podcast? What's a podcast? Why am I gay? Why? Why? <laughs> Ha 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 